All right, I'm here with Dr. Ben House. We're going to talk all things TRT and testosterone. So, Dr. House, what did you have for breakfast today, man? Uh, I eat, I wake up, I eat an RX bar, and then I come down to the barn and I train pretty much every day of the week. It's the same nice. flavor, <laughs> same thing every day. Just walking, walking down the hill, I eat an RX bar, walk down the hill, train. Nice, man. Well, I mean, you're, you're a machine, man, and it shows your, your physique is awesome. Your background is awesome. But can you give everyone just sort of a like a 30,000 foot aerial view of like who you are, what you're rocking in, like what you're interested in, kind of what we're going to talk about today? Yes. Yeah, so I have a PhD in nutritional sciences from UT Austin, and I've been a trainer since I was 19 years old and I'm 36 now. So that's 17 years. Uh, I was obviously I think a lot of us were uh, I was a cringy 19 year old trainer and um, I've, I feel like I've made some some headway and just had this opportunity to continue to learn as I've progressed in the field and it's been really, really fun. And I've worked with collegiate sports. I've worked with pro sports. I've worked, I've had the opportunity to work at every level, but also just regular people too. And I consider myself a regular, super regular person, failed athlete uh, that just fell in love with the, the gym like so many. And it's, it's a place where I think that no matter who comes into the space, the currency is effort. And if you're willing to put in effort over time, even if you're a low responder, right? You can, eventually you can figure something out that's going to work for you um, because that's what we do. We just try things. And, and I think that people can get discouraged when they don't get really, really fast results. Um, but if you keep trying and keep looking for something, I think eventually you're going to, you're going to find a path that'll, that'll work for you. Yeah, man. And that definitely worked for you. So I, I think what we really want to dive into today in this area that you are super well versed in is, is just all things testosterone, but really, I hate the word debunking. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but really talking about some of these things that are, are a little bit confusing surrounding the world of testosterone. And I want to open up with just the straight up question is, is testosterone legitimately required to build muscle, whether we're talking just what's naturally occurring or exogenous? I mean, what is, what's, go, what's going on here? Because I've seen it both sides, right? Yeah, the research is very clear uh, that you can males specifically can gain muscle mass without well they still have some testosterone but very little uh the this is blocked at the level of the brain so the they'll use a gnrh agonist big fancy acronyms big words um so basically they shut down endogenous testosterone production at the level of the brain and they put these guys, it's either that or a placebo, and then they put them on a resistance training protocol, and it does look like the results are attenuated, so they don't get as, the gains aren't as great, but they still get gains. So is it possible to gain muscle as a male with a 20 to 50 nanogram des per deciliter testosterone level? Yeah, it's possible. Um, and then on the flip side of that, you have the females can put on just as much muscle mass per their body weight. If you look at like just the, they can get about 85% as big as males, right? And they're about 80% as big, 80 to 85% as, as big as we are. And, and so, yes, can you put on muscle mass with very, with low testosterone concentrations? Absolutely. It's possible. Um, now, could there be some other things if someone has low testosterone that could be confounders in their ability to put on muscle mass? Like, yeah, if we have sleep apnea, if we have really high levels of inflammation, all of those other confounders, but then is it really to low testosterone that is so it's kind of the canary in the coal mine there. Like, is it really the thing or is it those other things that were leading to that potential lower testosterone level? Um, and then also we have, there's, there's a few studies now looking at like individual testosterone concentrations and how are they predictive of results? And they do not look to be predictive. So like serum, at, at, you have guys in the higher responder group you've, that are under 500 nanograms per deciliter, and you got guys in the lower responder group that are over a thousand nanograms per deciliter. Um, 
and I think we'll continue that that data is almost in its infancy. I'm really curious to see how that data comes together in the next five to 10 years. Um, but yes, I that and testosterone is complicated, too, because you're only looking at serum testosterone. You have there's a lot of other things in the system, right? You have sex hormone binding globulin, which is the the main bond you all testosterone is also attached to albumin and so that's how to start well, the majority of testosterone is not free it's not available um and so and that's not even getting into cell signaling like androgen receptor content so um it's very complex and the body probably has ways around to regulate this outside of just serum testosterone itself um did that kind of answer your question? Uh, yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And coming back to like a, even a very basic question, just for, for people that maybe don't understand, the difference between total testosterone and free testosterone, and is there a difference in how that potentially influences muscle mass? Like, is there a difference in how total testosterone influences potentially influences muscle mass compared to free testosterone potentially influencing muscle mass? Yeah, so I would I would make, I'm of the mind, this is my hypothesis here, that so the majority of testosterone is going to be bound to sex hormone binding globulin around 60 percent and then the other 30 ish percent uh is going to be bound to albumin that is categorized as weekly available or bioavailable and then do we also have there's a protein on the cell called megalin which can take that sex hormone binding globulin testosterone complex and bring it into the cell which is kind of cool um but i think for you for your question it's a complex question in that, so Navy SEALs, when they're on mission, special ops, is, we have a lot of data on special ops people because they, mm -hmm. number one, they get hit in the head, but they also have to like go on mission and then they can't eat a lot. Um, and you probably don't want to have lower sex, lower testosterone if you're, you know, out there and on a mission shooting people, right? It's yeah. probably, you probably yeah, want to have sure. that aggression, all the things that come along with that. Um, and so one of, one of the, big things that we found is that sex hormone binding globulin seems to go up in those we call them like multi-stressor environments so the body does seem to potentially have a way to auto regulate this in that in these situations where it, the body wouldn't want to put on muscle maybe it has this ability to upregulate sex hormone binding globulin um to hide it i th free testosterone is hard to measure um especially so back in the dizzy but now we're getting back at we're getting better like with the technology that we use to measure these things and and so i don't know that i would get it i would get a sex hormone binding globulin and a total testosterone i think it's good to have an idea of free testosterone sex hormone binding globulin is kind of hard to move so the only the things that drive sex hormone binding globulin down are bad uh, generally like liver failure, insulin resistance, things that you wouldn't want um, because sex hormone binding globulin is produced in the liver. If your sex hormone binding globulin is high, maybe you can make the argument, okay, maybe we need to deload, maybe we need to look at chronic stress, which you probably do anyways, right? Um, and But I don't know that that can make it move. Sex hormone binding globulin levels are also fairly hereditary uh, to the tune, I think, of like 70% hereditary somewhere in there. I'd have to look back at the exact citation. Um, but I think I'm in the ballpark. Yeah, no, I, I remember seeing that as well. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. If you're trying to find maybe lower carb snacks or things like that, figured it'd be helpful to put a link down below. Thrive Market's an online membership-based grocery store. They are a sponsor on this channel, so I throw them a bone whenever I can. So that link is down below. You'll save 30% off your full grocery order. So they have keto snacks, they have paleo snacks, Whatever, I don't think snacks are the end of the world, I just think we need to have them at the right place, right? So 30% off your entire grocery order, but also the $50 free gift when you do use that link down below. So if you're looking for different foods that you wanna kinda add to your arsenal, you wanna just experiment, or you're just looking for a better way to get groceries than going to the grocery store, use them down below, check that link out. So is there, and this is, uh, is, is there an interplay between overtraining cortisol and sex hormone binding globulin because you mentioned this so with shbgs if you I mean if you're if you're yeah. training to the max and you know, is it cortisol that seems to have the interplay or is it some other you know catecholamines that are chronically elevated or what is it there yeah cortisol is i mean it's really hard like ots uh, we're gonna get to we're gonna get to the land so we do have some there's the arrow study which looked at so ots is by definition very very hard to diagnose mm -hmm. 
because it's a bucket diagnosis. It's like all these other things, even exercise intolerance, things like that. So I don't, cortisol is maybe you can make an argument like 24 hour urinary cortisol could be predictive of these things. Um, the arrow study, which is a study in majority of cross majority of CrossFitters, like I don't think you get OTS just doing hypertrophy work or powerlifting. You probably have to get into OTS um, with you'd have to have some type of mixed modal s- stuff to probably get there with exercise. Um, and it, you also have OTS is confounded with uh, red at red S or relative energy deficiency in sport. It, so do I think that hormones can be used as a diagnostic criteria for, I don't feel good itis uh, maybe, but I would. So if we look at like, what is the best diet? What is the best factor for overtraining syndrome? It's going to be palm scores. It's going to be like, are you motivated to train? Things like that. Um, and so we have some studies that are kind of f- trying to figure out what are these predictive values. I don't know that cortisol is going to hold much water. You also have the testosterone to cortisol ratio. Um, cortisol is going to be elevated if someone is in an energy deficit, most likely, and that is what the body wants. Um, so take, for instance, Longland et al., 2016, the best body composition results we have ever seen in the literature. Uh, these cats lost about 11 pounds of body fat and gained 2.5 pounds of muscle in four weeks. And in that time, their cortisol went up by like 40 to 50 percent and their testosterone went down by 70 percent. And they still put on 2.5 pounds <laughs> of muscle and lost 11 pounds of fat. So. And now I would argue like they're in an active deficit. They're adding a training stimulus. How long is that runway going to last? I don't know. Um, but you eventually, I think those hormone changes are acute due to the energy availability and resistance training stimulus. Uh, so it kind of flies in the face of what people think is possible, right? Like they think that, Oh, if my testosterone goes down and my cortisol goes up, I'm going to be in trouble. No, I think that is actually an adaptation to probably what you want. So it's actually something that you might even want to see in the acute term. Um, And then you don't want to stay in that. You want to do the diet and then get out of the diet and then get back into a higher energy availability state. And then I think those things will auto-regulate if you get back up into energy balance. And then the body's also going to fight some level of body fat percentage where it's going to knock down thyroid hormone, knock down sex hormone body, like knock, knock down a lot of things, uh, and, and cause a lot of psychological and physiological stop gaps to, because it doesn't have enough food. Yes. That's the body's very good at that. Well, it's, I think you hit the nail on the head too. That comes back to the palm scores. It comes back to where's your, where are your motivations? Are you actually desiring to train? And it kind of comes back to, I mean, data in the wrong hands is very dangerous, right? It's like, and we take this, so many people want this objective number because, and I commend them for that, right? They want this objective number because they want to know when too much is too much or too little is too little. And I get that. Uh, But I usually caution people from that too, because I mean, too many variables, too much data in someone that doesn't necessarily know how to look at a global picture of all that data could be very dangerous and could be crippling, right? I mean, you're going to, if you're training just fine and then you go and you look at your testosterone to cortisol ratio and everything's out of whack and you, or I could say air quotes out of whack, then you say, oh, well, shoot, it's almost a license to lose motivation to train in a way, right? So it's, and then Tommy and I talked about this, Dr. Tommy Wood, and it was like, it's like, you know, which came first, right? It's like, is it seeing the data and then losing your motivation to train? And I think, you know, ultimately what you're saying here is some of the best drivers are just, are you symptomatic, right? Like if low testosterone, like, are you sure you have low testosterone but are you symptomatic of low testosterone like how is the basic things how are your how's your libido how's your you know all these things and i've had relatively low testosterone for a long time probably because i stay really lean year round my sex drive is fine i put on muscle just fine it's never been an issue right so i don't know it's at least my my side so i i think there's there's a lot of ways to look at it 
I would say if someone is on the lower end of the range, we want to try to do the things to get them up, right? Like what's your energy availability, all of those types of questions. But the thing that I worry about in, in this world that we live in currently is that you see a number and then you give yourself the symptomatology of it. Um, and the, it's it's pretty clear that most of the societies and uh, like the endocrine society and a lot of these global organizations they do not recommend global testing of testosterone like the, it's not something that, like we're going to cast this wide if you cast this wide net you're going to get a lot of things um you're going to get a lot of so i actually i think a great place to start is like erectile dysfunction in testosterone because I think guys can see that they have a lower testosterone and then maybe even like psychologically give themselves ED because we have placebo controlled trials that look at like when is, when is, what level of testosterone is kind of erectile function impaired. And it looks to be around 250 nanograms per deciliter, maybe even lower in controlled trials when, when you have placebo controlled trials. And I think people are somewhat flabbergasted by that. Um, I know I was the first time that I read those, but, and, and so I'm, I think that we, if we're going to get, if you're going to go get these values, you need to have somebody on the back end that actually knows what they're doing can look at this from a bird's eye view and kind of figure it out. And if things are off, what are you going to do? It's, I don't want to get into this predeterministic fatalistic viewpoint where like, Oh my God, my testosterone is at 400. I'm screwed. No, like there's no way. There's so many things that we can do. There's so many, there's so many things that could lead to that, that could be, that could potentially be fixed. Um, or it might not even need to be fixed. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is something that, that Eric Helms and I have talked about recently is like, if you are fine with your physique and you have enough muscle mass and you want to live a little bit leaner, you could make the argument that having a little bit lower testosterone and living a little bit leaner might be something that you be, might be okay with. Um, your metabolic health could, the leaner that you are, the more like it, it all depends like what you want. So I, what are your goals? What are your intentions? Right. Um, and then having an objective view of that and then coming back to what is, what does this person want to do on their journey? Um, and that, that's where I'm at. If someone wants to, like, so if someone wants to take TRT, okay, fine. What are the downsides of that? What are the cost benefits of that? How can, how can you do that really, really well? But I don't think a lot of people are getting into this conversation with a lot of background knowledge. And then I don't think a lot of times they're getting very good advice or to their specific case and they're not being told of the ramifications of this over the long term. Dude, totally. Potential. It, it, it's scary. I mean, going uh, slight tangent, but with, with the way social media is now and almost the normalizing of anabolics and this, this it, it's normalized. It's like a normal discussion to be having. And to be, it's, it, it's scary, right? And it's like even people that I widely respect within the industry that are talking about this. And that's, yeah, it does scare me a little bit because it opens this door a little bit for people. And, you know, one of the things that you touched on this, and I'll just kind of elaborate, like if I, if I'm a little bit leaner and my testosterone is a little bit lower, there's a pretty powerful psychological effect to looking in the mirror, feeling leaner and having a better libido. There is something that goes along with that. People kind of get inside their own heads. I've seen people that have testosterone levels at seven, 800, perfectly fine, but they're not happy with their bodies. And because of that, they lack the confidence to really get it up. Right. So it's, there is so many different directions you could take this and being you know, isolating one thing and freaking out over it. And I don't know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but anyway, I mean, going back to this, I had, I did a video like three or four years ago, kind of dice, trying to dissect this the best that I could and understanding, because there was that frontiers and physiology paper. Um, you probably are familiar with it. It talks about just androgen receptor density and uh, you know, kind of the, uh, I'm sure you're the responder, non-responder. So, with this androgen receptor content on a Stu Phillips lab, yes, the yes, receptor exactly. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that hasn't. But there's, I think there's four studies now. It hasn't been super replicated. It's very interesting. So like the androgen receptor upregulation was predictive of the horm the hypertrophy response. I, I think I'm nailing that. Yes. Yep. Um, and then 
but systemic hormone increase was not, it, we wouldn't expect it to be. It's it, growth hormone and testosterone are going to go up from training, but it's such a blip on the area under the curve that it's not going to be related to long term adaptations. Got it. Um, but the, it, it is interesting that training can potentially upregulate the angio receptor. I find this interesting. We need more research on it. I think we're going to get more research on it because it is a sexy topic. Um, and it seems to help be helpful potentially in older individuals, even if it doesn't help systemic hormone levels. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it, if it's not my, if I'm trying to like convince someone to resist this train, I don't know how high this up is up on my like deck of cards. Like I got, I got a lot of like, I could pick death. I could pick longevity. I could pick physical function over the lifespan. I, if someone's like super, I, like if they're a super nerd, I could, maybe I would pick that as a way. Like, oh, you want to tra- add resistance training? Yeah, it could upregulate your, your angio receptor content. Um, but yeah, I, I would say we need, in science, we have a crisis of replicability. So we, a lot of those studies, you, because of exercise science generally being lower sample size, underpowered studies. Yeah we're going to be very susceptible to false positives. Um, and those will have a higher likelihood of being published. I'm not throwing any shade. I be, I'm not throwing any shade at that finding. I don't think that's what happened necessarily there. Um, it's possible, but that's just part kind of par for the course in the nutrition and, and training literature. So we're generally going to see something, some novel finding like keto, for example, you might have you like keto now looks to we we think that it blunts training at adap- hypertrophy adaptations. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have the confounder of water and glycogen storage there, so maybe if you repleted, it it gets a little bit weird. But the studies that we do have show that it probably does blunt. That's not to say that you can't gain muscle on a keto approach. I think that you absolutely can. Uh, Luis is great with keto gains, and I think you can probably do that very well. Um, but it's just we're going to have these we're going to have essentially these studies showing one thing and then they're going to get replicated and then we're going to figure out if it is or it isn't a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah and see, that I, takes time. It's kind of interesting. On the, on the key, I, I've talked about this before. It's, it, you know, parts part of it is even the question of uh, androgens aside is if someone is in a deep ketogenic state is the potential anti-inflammatory effect which is seeming we're trying starting to see a regression to the mean a little bit with some of even the you know anti-inflammatory effects of beta hydroxybutyrate but possibly uh blunting sort of that inflammatory response that's necessary uh. after a workout right so tommy and i talked about that too and it's kind of in, it's all like up in the air right now but it is interesting we are seeing that regression to the mean of like okay well maybe it's not the inflammatory because that's what we kind of chalked it up to before we're like maybe oh. you're actually blocking some of this Andrew's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, I don't know. Who knows, right? I mean, that's all That's all theory and it is what it is and it's uh, interesting to noodle on, but we can't take it to the bank. So, I um, mean, we can bring this back though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject because we can bring it back because we do have, I think it came out of 2021. I can go find it. Um, there's a one of the better keto resistance training papers that we have found that serum testosterone, I believe, went from 500 to 800 hmm. on the keto approach and they didn't gain muscle or get stronger. Interesting. So, the, yeah. so yeah, let me, um, I, I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards so you have it, the link in the show notes. But cool. yeah, testosterone went up on a ketogenic, higher saturated fat approach. Um, but with resistance training, they, it, they still didn't get better gains than the non-keto approach, um, even with those, those essentially androgen levels that went up by three or 400 nanograms per deciliter, which is from a dietary standpoint, that is highly significant. Like that we, that's big. Like, and so I would say if you're, that's another thing. If your testosterone is, there's a weird, I'm going to, there's kind of an intersection here with Tommy too, that I've actually seen in on labs. So some people may have to make the decision if you're a hyper responder and like you're set, this isn't going to be everyone, but if saturated fat, potentially does lead increasing your total fat content, increasing saturated fat content for you does. And there's a paper by Whitaker, which has gone over these different types of fats. Um, If changing, if increasing those saturated fats does increase your testosterone, and this can be very individual, 
it might also increase your serum cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you may be in this window of kind of having to choose, um, which is interesting to me. I, I am, uh, I'm running an experiment on myself. I'm about to, about to add in butter and refeed and see what happens. Cause I think it is very, it, like I'm, I don't eat butter. Uh, butter's the thing that raises LDL cholesterol. My LDL cholesterol is always very low, like yeah. under 150 without any pharmacology. I just have very low total, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Um, and so I'm curious to see if I can get my cholesterol up and then what are the things that that does. Um, and so uh, put a pin in it. I'll probably have results in like a month or so. Yeah, that'll be that'll be an interesting one, man, because like, I mean, the saturated fat topic in and of itself, specifically within the keto community is an interesting one. Right. Because I'm probably of the people that I did keto straight for probably five or six years when I lost a bunch of weight and now I kind of dabble in and out of it. I'm all just about doing everything at this point, like whatever, whatever works and whatever I change up just to get some fun out of. But I've sort of been a little bit more of the loud mouth in the keto community, if you even want to call it that, that says, hey, like maybe you should still be conscious of your saturated fat, right? Like, they, you know, it's like we can't deny a lot of this data that's out there that regardless, I mean, it's not like overfeeding saturated fat is still not exactly the greatest thing, but that's overfeeding it, right? So different different situation. I think I think you'll find that's interesting. I mean, because I talked to Dr. Dom Agostino about this as well. Uh, and one of the indicators that he mentioned was if you're someone that when you increase your fat content and you're doing, say, keto, I mean, you're not doing keto, but for people that are, as they increase their particularly saturated fat content, if triglycerides go up, that's an indicator that you're one of these people that probably shouldn't be increasing that. And that's simply because at what given level, the liver is having a hard time with ketogenesis, right? So it's not, and there are a subset of people that are like that. It's like they increase their fats and their triglycerides just go up and they don't necessarily, doesn't translate to more ketones. So it's kind of interesting. So I don't want to get off into a rabbit hole too much, but it's just very, very interesting. And then kind of connecting dots in my own mind, do you think there's a chance, and this is again, it, purely hypothetical, that the reason perhaps that we saw such an increase in testosterone when people went on keto is because such a large portion of the non-athletic population is insulin resistant and simply by, and that interplay with SHBG and all that, right? Because that's one thing that we have seen in literature that insulin resistance and sex hormone binding globulin could play a role. Maybe it was as simple as that. It's not the magic of ketones. It's the fact that they were eliminating hyperpalatable processed sugar and stuff. I mean, it's, uh, mm. it's a thought. I don't, so the, the inflammation I think would have been, I'm trying to think of like a mechanism of why. So I don't think that it is substrate availability. Mm -hmm. The, the limiter in testosterone production at, from Leydig cells, um, is going to be, it's not cholesterol. There's tons of cholesterol around. Like, so it's, it's not a, it's not like the rate limiting step. It's the star protein is going to get super, like there's tons of acronyms, not going to waste time. The, the rate limiting step of testosterone is, um, is cholesterol going in, being shuttled into the mitochondria. Um, but so I don't think it's LD, I don't think it's necessarily like saturated fat driving up LDL cholesterol, which allows you to produce more testosterone. I don't think that's the signal. Um, I think that it's probably something either brain-based or we know that inflammation can knock down testosterone at the level of the Leydig cells. And I'm also not sure about the insulin component because these folks were on higher protein. So they're ah. still going to have that insulinogenic effect. And I would get, we don't know this, but this is from locks research in females and energy availability we need there's a there's actually a little piece here that we do need more literature on and i don't know that we're going to get it and that is the independent effect of carbohydrate availability versus low energy availability so for instance like if you're on a diet and you're eating 200 grams of carbs versus 50 and then obviously flat fat is going to seesaw with that protein is probably going to be held constant does does raising your carbs up does that potentially help with this pulsatile nature of GnRH and LH at the level of the brain? Because Lock Locks found that in females under thirty kcal's per kilogram of fat free mass. So now we're throwing out more stuff, but in a low energy state, that pulsatile 
from the brain, which is that's what's really, really important for testosterone production, that was limited. And so we need to see like, okay, if you're in an energy deficit, but you're still eating a bunch of carbs, do you maintain that pulsatile nature of GnRH and LH at the level of the brain? We need more studies on that in particular. So that that question of like, I would surmise that insulin would, in the right context, insulin and leptin would be upregulators of testosterone because they're going to signal that there's food in the environment. Yeah. And so I would, I would hypothesize that those things are both going to be probably permissive of testosterone production. I don't know if they're going to upregulate it or not, but that would be my hypothesis. And then if you have someone that would need to be done in a healthy population and then your unhealthy population, you're going to have a lot of confounders there that I think are going to be hard to untangle what is causing that increase in testosterone. It's such an interesting thought. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I didn't think about the higher protein intake on a ketogenic diet with that particular study. So you're kind of having this constant insulin, insulin signaling that's happening there. So that does make sense. So that kind of eliminates that. Interesting though. It's, it's, and moving on. So I kind of want to, one thing we talked about before this was DHT. And I, I think people watching might need like a, just a 60 second explanation of testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, and, and, and this whole process and how this works anyway. Because I know people think, okay, steroids, side effects, this, that might be a good way to kind of bridge the gap and explain to even a beginner population what's happening here. Yeah, you so testosterone has anabolic effects, which we primarily like, global right like anabolic like you can have cardiac muscles gonna grow your skeletal muscles gonna grow prostates gonna grow like so so that anabolic versus androgenic and this is measured in rats by two different muscles growing um so that's how they test whether a testosterone derivative is going to be more anabolic or more androgenic and most of the time with testosterone people want the anabolic effects but they don't necessarily want the androgenic effects androgenic effects would be uh, male pattern baldness, the negative ones, the androgenic effects are like the male, um, the maleification, uh, it's a made up word, but like <laughs> just your male, male sex characteristics are going to be uh, pr predominantly thought of as DHT. So testosterone can go one of two ways. Once it's produced, it can go to estradiol, which would be uh, aromatase, or it can go uh, to DHT, which is the five alpha reductase pathway. And, Yes, it does seem like DHT is binds the androgen receptor a little bit more potently. Um, it is also mm, potentially going to be more predictive of kind of those male characteristics. We have multiple studies now which block DHT and somewhat surprisingly, you can block DHT with uh, fernestamide. Um, and so this is done in a, like TRT. If people get a lot of symptomatology of DHT, they might block that pathway. Um, and so Basin did this research. Basin's all over the testosterone research, but they blocked, uh, for Nest they had vernestamide, so they blocked alpha reductase. So testosterone was not converted to DHT. Um, and those people still made the same amount of gains as the people. So essentially they just blocked that pathway. Um, and they still made those gains. I don't, and that, that's not a natural setting, right? Like, um, so I'm, if I didn't have to block DHT, I wouldn't block DHT. But if you're getting cystic acne and you have male pattern baldness, you, it's it, like, so it's debated whether it helps. There's lots of debate in this world. Um, yeah. Does that Yeah, help? no, no, it does for sure. And so is it sort of bio-individual who is going to say, or is it compound specific, I guess, uh, if you're talking exogenous, who's going to have more uh, DHT conversion and go side effects that route versus who's going to go more aromatization route and, you know, more estrogen side effects? Or is it really just random? No idea. Yeah. Uh, I think there's going to be a large individual variability here. I would say that if you have more skin and more adipose tissue, you will probably convert more of that testosterone to estradiol. Um, the I don't estradiol gets slammed, uh, especially in males. Estrogen is extremely important for bone, for libido, for muscle. Like you do not want to tank. We know yeah. this. We know this now. I think we can say it at that level. You do not want to just t go ahead and like flippantly tank your estradiol uh, with something like an uh, like an aromatase blocker, like a Rimidex. And, and it's because 
we figured out that it's probably a ratio of these of these things that is important and estrogen is is very very important and and it also is important for fat distribution so we have these studies we have a lot of these studies now where they have they give testosterone and then they block estrogen and the group that blocks estrogen they tend to maintain more intra abdominal fat they it, it's not it's not good um so so i think a lot where again to make things always more complex if someone does have high estradiol like potentially ha carrying a lot of adipose tissue, a lot of extra adipose tissue. And that scenario, blocking estradiol because estradiol is a break on testosterone production. And that scenario, maybe it can be helpful, but it's gonna have to be way out of lab range. Yeah. Um, and so the, there, the, like, sorry, I cannot make this simple uh, because it's not. <laughs> no, like, dude, no, don't no, worry this about is it. simple. I cannot, make, like, and so, and so the, anyone who's trying to make this cookie, cookie cutter simple for you, is probably selling you some yeah um yeah. and that's that's what i think is is the most pervasive thing with hormones on the internet because there's so many feedback cycles feed forward and feedback mechanisms this stuff is really complex and in this race to simplify it and also this race to measure it because we do have so much adiposity in our current world and adiposity is gonna be the number one reason for males having lower testosterone um you're if you go measure these things on a population level, you're gonna go find it. And then if you go find it, what do you got? You got an EFT payment on the backside. That is a great business model. Um, so all of those ads that you see on your Instagram feed for measuring testosterone, they are not innocuous. They know what they're doing. They know if they fish, they're going to catch fish. And then those, those fish are going to be EFT payments. Um, and I would argue that that is unethical, disingenuous, and, without a full workup, without someone talking to you about the complexity. And and if you don't want, the other thing is like, if you don't want to take testosterone, if, if, if you don't want to take TRT and someone hasn't, you don't have informed consent, like they haven't told you about, okay, what are the ramifications? And, and TRT is very useful. It can be great in the right circumstances. I have nothing against TRT, um, but this should be informed consent by the individual. And they should, if they don't want to do it, they should try other things yeah. like that is that is what the endocrine society says too like it for it doesn't necessarily need to be a first line therapy and if someone's just looking at a total testosterone and and giving you a, a trt like it's a vitamin uh that's a that's a problem in my mind i completely agree i mean there's a reason i'm not an angel but there's a reason that i purposely don't do a lot of testosterone content even like i just feel it's somewhat this is one of the first videos that's going even in depth it's it's such a difficult thing to be able to it's practically impossible to simplify and me not being a clinician i'm not qualified to to say this to people i'm not qualified to even try to simplify it but i can you know explain an overhead view of what's going on basically but it's frustrating. I mean, it's a whole separate discussion, but it's it's very frustrating, and I would say it's borderline illegal to even, you know, I think they're finding loopholes to be able to ultimately do telehealth consults that aren't real telehealth consults in some ways, and it's uh, it's it's frustrating with a lot of the stuff that you're seeing online with that. So, yeah, I mean, totally agree there. Uh, jumping over to another hormone that is talked about a lot, okay, growth hormone. Now I know you have done some stuff on this. <laughs> I want to leave some time to talk about other things too, but there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding the world of growth hormone. Um, you know, and one of the funny things is being someone that's an, uh, an intermittent fasting guy myself a couple days a week, I, I do it, you know, two days a week nowadays. And it's mainly just because it's an easy way for me to get a deficit. I mean, plain and simple. Yeah. It's like, I'm not, I'm not sure. I could talk about different benefits, but the same benefits are probably going to apply for caloric deficit in the first place. Right. I think there's camps of people that just psychologically do well with fasting and camps of people that don't. And I leave it at that. Uh, but that being said, within this, I see people always talking about like 2000% increase in growth hormone with fasting. And it's like the most hilarious thing ever. Right. Because it's like, okay, that aside, it's just, that's just one of the many things. First of all, people think growth hormone is the end all be all. Uh, and there's just so much surrounding it. So I don't know where to begin with this, but I kind of want to just turn it over to you. Like the role of growth hormone in the body compared to what people are playing it out to be on social media right now. Maybe I'll just turn it over to you because you're solid on this. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it has a great name. 
Girl, that one has a fantastic name. Uh, we, I think we can go back to that Longland study that we talked about before. Like, they went in a caloric deficit. They did all these things. The testosterone went down from 500 to 100. Uh, cortisol went up by 30 to 40 percent and growth hormone went up too oh my god growth so like you could if you just look at growth hormone you're like wow wow but then if you go look at igf1 igf1 tanked um and so like okay yes growth hormone is going up but what's happening to igf1 and then we know like inside of physiologic levels like this stuff as far as hypertrophy probably doesn't matter you're gonna get a growth like you're gonna get a growth hormone response from doing like more metabolic can, more metabolic type resistance training. I can make a lot of arguments outside of growth hormone for why people might want to do that, like angiogenesis, bringing blood vessels into the tissue. I, I can just make a, it's more efficient, like higher rep resistance training. I don't need growth hormone to make that argument. Um, that said, there, I do think there is, so growth hormone and hypertrophy, it does tend to lead to hypertrophy, but not for the reasons that people think probably because growth hormone will lead to uh, the retention of water. Um, so I would guess if you take growth hormone, you're going to get some water retention in your muscles. And there's, but that's not to say that, so growth hormone can, ex, that we're talking about exogenous growth hormone here. Exogenous growth hormone can increase collagen production. Um, so maybe it can help with soft tissue repair. Maybe we have, we're, we're in the world of maybes here. So, um, and we, uh, and so that's where we're at with growth hormone. We're, we're not talking about so, like crazy, super physiologic amounts of growth hormone. I do think that we have enough, I guess you'd call it anecdotal evidence from the enhanced world that our current cocktail of drugs being like insulin. So insulin is, is, is only going to be boost anabolics. Who's, Insulin is only going to boost muscle protein synthesis and everything involved in that when you go very super physiological. Um, you can get the muscle pro the insulin response that you need from just protein post-workout. Um, but when you combine ins insulin, so just to put this in perspective to people how not physiological this is. Uh, you would never have encountered, so growth hormone, growth hormone goes off in people it really only has one spike a day and that's in slow wave sleep. And so you're generally not eating when you're in slow wave sleep, unless you have a catheter in your arm or something like that. So humans would never have really encountered a high growth hormone state and a post prandial or with food. So you like, this is a very non normal state to have a lot of insulin running around, a lot of growth hormone running around and a, and a ton of tests running around. Um, and we and it looks like our current smattering of drugs has obviously made people big. So there's probably some synergy between these all these compounds. Um, but if we're just talking about natural levels from that are oscillating inside of physiologic ranges, I'm not convinced that it super matters. Um, I'm not sure if I explain that in a way that is digestible to people. I, drugs are different. I think the key fact. Drugs are very different than your own body spiking inside of physiologic ranges. They're, they're just incredibly different. Yep. The, uh, the time course of them, the area under the curve. Um, and so that's where like sauna can spike growth hormone. Is sauna going to reliably increase hypertrophy? Heat shock proteins, lots of other big words. I don't know. You can make the argument maybe with angiogenesis. Is it going to be a large effect size adding sauna to your resistance training routine? On your, Is it going to overwhelm the resistance training? Absolutely not. Yeah. I'm willing to make that bet. Could it be synergistic? I got no idea. Yeah. Um, try it if you like it. Yeah, I sure. don't think, like, we're probably talking about sing, single percentage points, but I, is fasting going to augment your resistance training response? No, like, let's, that's ludicrous. Um, it just, it's, I think you can, if someone throws out growth hormone, like that exact thing you just said, fasting increases your growth hormone. So we're going to fast and then we're going to do a resistance training and then you're going to get better results from that than you would have if you were training pros prandially. I'm willing to say that that person does not understand science yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, and they're just trying to sell you maybe even like a PDF or some type of program 
based on a mechanism. And dude, I took that hook, line, and sinker when I was 19 years yeah, old. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> I was I was in the game. Like growth hormone was cool. Um, and it can get it can get definitely get people to train harder. Like if I tell you you go 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off, and you go ham, and because growth hormone you train harder and you get maybe you get better results which is which is great yeah that counts for something yeah and you know like i always default with with saunas on that i'm a big sauna guy but i always default to a sauna as hey it's essentially jacking up your heart rate in a lot of ways it's mimicking some low intensity cardiovascular work and if that helps your resistance training baseline then awesome great right it's uh, I, i feel like Again, it's one of these things where, yeah, cool evidence with heat shock proteins, interesting stuff. Is that going to enhance your resistance training? Only if you let it, right? Like it's 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 not magically going to do it. If it's go, if you and if you psychologically get a benefit out of that, and I know a lot of people that say, okay, like I sit in a sauna for ten minutes before I work out. Yeah, it loosens you up. It makes you feel good. Maybe it warms you up, and maybe psychologically it gets things going. And Yes, exactly the same kind of thing. And I did an Instagram reel the other day that is uh, kind of interesting. I don't usually do those, but it was just talking about, okay, if you like to train fasted or if you like to train fed, like then effing do both. Like, like if you think there's benefits to one, you think there's benefits to the other, then like, why do you have to sit in one camp? Like if you feel like, and there's a good amount of people that just prefer to train fasted. It doesn't mean that it's the best thing in the world. There's a good amount of people that prefer to train fed. Like, preference personal preference counts for a lot i mean a a whole lot i would argue because that's just what drives you as a person and i think that's just not sexy enough to sell on social media right now right like people don't like you can't put a post up there that says like hey guess what personal preference and it's not going to get a bunch of attention right so you have to kind of sit in this camp and it's uh and fight the other people yeah you gotta fight you gotta fight right you gotta have conflict so conflict grabs eyeballs it's it's yeah I think saunas, I'm, it's very interesting to see like people argue about probably low effect size strategies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's super interesting. I, do I think it's probably a better idea to train with protein in the system? Yes, I can make that argument for a lot of reasons. Now, if you do, I think that it will matter a ton if you get a good protein bolus right after your training if you're training fasted no i think that that's where the anabolic window is probably important whereas if you're training post prandially or you have some protein in the system you probably got a little bit more wiggle room of when you want protein next um i that's if someone is i don't think people realize how long it would take for us to do the research we would lose people by the time we would have some type of effect there. Like you would have to watch people for probably years to pick up that effect size. If there was one, like I'm guessing if total protein was controlled throughout the day, if someone fasted and then immediately drank a protein shake versus someone who ate 20 grams of protein, like what, like let's just compare me versus someone like me eating an RX bar, which has 12 grams of protein. And then I, and then I eat Greek yogurt, like 30 grams of protein from Greek yogurt after I train. Like that's, that's what I do. Now, if you took away my RX bar and I just ate the Greek yogurt and I trained fasted, I don't do, I got no idea how long it would take to pick that up from a signal perspective. Totally. But, but I'm not willing to guess either. (laughs) So like, cause I like to eat the RX bar before I train personal preference. So no, I'm totally with you on that, man. I mean, it's, and as someone that's dabbled in, in both sides and I've, I've made that exact argument with, with fasting, exactly like what you just said. It's like, if you are fasting, I would try to make the argument that you are better off possibly training towards the latter part of your fa- of your fasting window mm-hmm. so that you can break yeah. your fast with your post-workout meal. You're killing two birds with one stone. And even if it's purely hypothetical at this point, you're also pretty insulin sensitive from your workout and your fast. So, hey, guess what? Maybe you can capitalize on the anabolic window even more and you can make that argument. So, But that scares people because they're like, well, that means I'm the fast at the end of a, or workout at the end of a 16 hour fast. I mean, come on, if you're waking up in the morning, you're training fast, you're probably training 12 or 13 hours fasted anyway. So it's, you know, anyway, I digress. But I, I would I would I would say we do have literature showing that intermittent fasting may not blunt hypertrophy responses. The majority of that is out of my friend Grant Tinsley's lab out of Texas Tech. And every one of those studies, they worked out in their eating window interesting so 
So they always trained in all of those studies trained in their eating window. I, do, I am not comfortable taking that literature out into training, not yeah. in your eating window. Yeah. Um, I would need to see those studies. The Ramadan studies um, look like hypertrophy is possible in that scenario, but it's not ideal. Yeah, exactly. And I, I would, I would argue like in untrained individuals, you're going to get a large muscle protein synthesis response just from resistance training. And then you're, your protein intake will make that higher and it'll support that. Um, so I would, I would make a, I mean, I don't think it's going to kill anyone, but for your gains, I would make a strong stance to either end your fast with a, with training or to have your training inside of your eating yes. window in some way. I definitely agree, especially for, for hypertrophy. And I, I like a lot of the evidence now is starting to point towards, okay, maybe early time restricted feeding is the better option with intermittent fasting, essentially. Better, you know, better, more yeah, like yeah, better. Right? Well, and the reason, that I'm suge- the reason that I'm saying this is because it actually alludes right to your point. Like if someone is particularly training in the morning, which mm-hmm. I have a bias because yeah. I train in the morning, right? Well, that allows that allows them to, okay, cut out their eating, maybe at, you know, whatever, start their fast, hypothetically, 4 or 5 p.m., whatever. And then they go and they fast through the night and it allows them to have breakfast before they train. So it's, and I mentioned that, I'm just like, okay, if you're, you know, if you're, again, personal preference, people like to fast. Some people, you're not going to change their mind one way or the other. They just, they've done it for years, but trying to get them to say, hey, you know, yeah. stop just skipping breakfast. Why don't you flip it on its head a little bit and maybe just eat a little bit earlier. And then that way you can train fed. And guess what? You might notice you get more growth out of that. But we're splitting hairs here at the end of the day. It's just, but more and more interesting literature when you're comparing early time restricted feeding to midday or late time restricted feeding. Yeah, it seems like that is more advantageous for people that train in the morning, which I train in the morning. So I tend to look at that. Um, and I would make the counter argument that even if early time restricting is early time restricted feeding is like somewhat better for appetite, which is the primarily maybe a little bit independent on insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity because you're more insulin sensitive in the morning. Like, I don't think these things have large effect sizes, nor do they matter a lot. I would make the argument that if someone had like so female client, they they're on the lower total daily energy expenditure. So to, in order for them to change their body composition, they do actually have to be yeah. fairly low mm-hmm. on calories. Right? I would make the argument if they have a family, I'm going to nine out of 10 times put the majority of their calories at dinner um, because socially it's going to overwhelm anything because if they can't have a larger dinner, they're just going to be staring at, you know, like three green beans and a three ounce piece of chicken. Um, and so I, I think you have you have ideal mechanistically and then you have practicality yeah, yes. meets the real world. Dude, I couldn't agree more. And I think I mentioned that probably till I'm blue in the face where it's like, that's the sucky thing. I've got two kids. I've got a wife. Yeah, you're not going to find me skipping dinner all the time. Like, and I zero percent chance. I generally recommend when people fast, I'm like, well, like, if you're going to fast every day, that's sorry, guys, that's no different than caloric restriction like you're just you're just continually reducing calories every day i like my fasting personally to be an anomaly do i have literature to back up that maybe as an anomaly is better not necessarily but i like to keep i like to move a lot and i like to eat a lot i'm a big believer in g-flux i'm a big believer in like i want to eat as much as i can until i start to gain fat and move as much as i can and then reel it back the best way that i reel it back is through aggressive shots in the arm with like maybe two 18 hour fasts a week or something like it's like it's not anything ridiculous and i understand it's a fasting lifestyle for people so i don't want to like rain on that parade and me being someone that like really gets people excited about that i don't want to discount that like if that's working for you by all means Mm -hmm. but just keep in mind that like if you're just skipping breakfast every day you're just skipping dinner every day you're going to fall back right into the same metabolic issue that you would be if you were just restricting calories You're, you're you're just still so keep it I don't know, an anomaly. So. Yeah, I I think that fasting is a, is an amazing tool. I don't think it's independently doing all of that much. Uh, people yell at me about that. Um, but it's very practically useful. And even in the holidays, like we see, we have multiple studies now showing that 
if you can use some type of like fasting protocol or like a modified fast, like a fasting mimicking diet for two days of the week, you may like normal people might be able to lose one or two pounds during the holidays mm -hmm. versus the average person is gaining two pounds during the holidays. So just somewhat restricting yourself and using one of these tools for two days might open up enough flexibility on those other days so that you can be social. So there's kind of your anomaly, yeah. like, no, totally. Is yeah. how much is, how much is like, even me personally, like how much is lunch worth to me on a Monday versus how much is dinner worth to me on a Saturday? Amen. Yep. Yeah, exactly, dude. Tom, uh, Tommy and I talk about just this, right? And there's one person in particular, I'm not going to name names, uh, but people probably know of him. And Tommy and I, we have, we share oh. a lot of, <laughs> we share a lot of opinions on a lot of things. We disagree on a number of things, but we share a lot of opinions on, especially things surrounding fasting and training. And it's, uh, this one particular well-known individual had suggested you should like fast before Thanksgiving dinner and all this. And it's like, and, and just being able to, there is some literature that suggests that like when you like, fast and then basically just go into this massive binge, like it's not a good thing, right? It's not a good thing. And not because of overfeeding, like overfeeding syndrome is very specific for, uh, or should say uh, refeeding syndrome, excuse me, is, is very specific for like longer fasts, right? That you're not gonna encounter that in a normal population that's intermittent fasting. But if someone is suggesting, hey, do a 48 hour fast before you go into eating 6,000, 7,000 calories of Thanksgiving dinner, that's not exactly a healthy thing to do, right? It looks like disordered eating. Well, it's eating disordered eating, but I can't remember how Tommy had pointed it out. He, he, he actually sent me, I'll have to, you, I'll link it down yeah, below. He, I have the, I have the study. So like, if you go keto, like we have, we know I, I can, Tommy and I have reviewed these together. So if you don't eat carbohydrates for like 24 hours, you will be, you are, your body's not used to that. Glucose intolerant. Yeah. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So like when you throw them back in, you will get a larger spike. Yes. yes. So that's essentially what he's getting at. I would yeah, believe yeah. that. And I have talked about just that. I'm like, exactly with keto. Like, Hey, you know, don't be surprised that your, you know, glucose intolerance is going, your glucose tolerance is going to drop, right? It's, it's, that it explains, and also to a certain degree, physiologic insulin resistance. So when you do have carbs, although it's a physiological normal thing to happen, mm -hmm. you're going to have this spike, right? It's yeah. going to take a few days for that to come back down and to normalize. However, in a very acute situation, if you take someone that doesn't ordinarily fast, doesn't have a level of, to a certain degree, fat adaptation, doesn't have a level of, uh, you know, fat transporters, doesn't have that stuff elevated. And you say, hey, fast for three days and then go eat 400 grams of carbs worth of stuffing. That's not like, I can't believe they were even saying that. This is a well-known person. So Tommy and I were like, you know, it makes a lot more sense, even though it can be sort of a binge and purge mentality, disordered eating. It's almost better to enjoy your Thanksgiving meal and then maybe fast after the Thanksgiving meal for a day, you know, it, but the problem with that is for the wrong people. And unfortunately with fasting, you get a lot of addictive personalities that do that. Mm -hmm. That creates a vicious cycle too, right? It's like, oh, I ate a lot. Now I'm just going to fast. So you need to have, that's where having objective markers, not necessarily biomarkers, but objective markers like friends that tell you, dude, you're starving yourself or, you know, those kinds of things matter. And um, I know this wasn't a fasting topic, but this is good stuff. And I think my audience is a lot of fasters and I think they need to hear it because it's important that they don't overstep and, and mess themselves up in the process. Yeah, DB, I, I, there's a book on this that I, that I really do like. I, I think that fasting protocols can look a lot like binge like eating episodes and I, I we get people get scared about throwing those words out um and i 100 get that and i i i'm feeling you on this this cycle of like eating a lot and then not eating uh, there's a book called dbt for emotional eating dbt is dialectical behavioral therapy the book itself has been researched and it seems to be helpful so people just reading the book can can be helpful because it gives them skills. Um, and and so I think like if you're in this world of I'm going to deprive myself and then I'm going to treat myself and that seems to be a vicious cycle for you that's not getting you, you where you want to be, then you may need another tool in your tool belt. Just like fasting is a tool in your tool belt, just like higher protein intakes are a tool in your tool belt. You might need some psychological tools as well that can that can help you navigate this space 
maybe a little bit more consistently. Yeah, that is, yeah, that's very, very helpful because I think that that, that happens a lot. And, and I think the operative, the operative things that you said there, thing that you said there was, if it's not getting you where you want to be. And I think the amount of frustration you see in people that are, are fasting, they're starting to see certain results, but they're not, they're not getting to where they want to be and they're not emotionally happy. Um, and that's a very important piece. And again, a, a different story for a different day, but I'll link that, that book down below. If you can just shoot it to me afterwards, I'll put it, I'll put it down below. Um, and I want to end on one thing. So we talked a lot about muscle building and I got to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes, but back to low testosterone for a minute. We talked about low testosterone and muscle. Is there much evidence that suggests lower testosterone is going to affect fat loss from, from that side of things? Or is it a little bit of the same thing where maybe it's not as important as we're being sold? It's important. Uh, they lose this. I'm, I'm fairly, I can be direct and clear on this one. Um, in low testosterone states, if you control for calories, they lose the same amount of adipose tissue. Um, even in the worst of circumstances, this is in generally in older males with lower testosterone repleted or not repleted. Um, the argument for using testosterone on a deficit is without resistance training, they may maintain lean body mass better. Um, so the difference is lean body mass retention um, in a deficit, which which in older individuals is a big deal because you don't. That's that's the argument against the diets in older individuals because you will lose lean body mass, um, especially it doesn't matter your protein intake. If you don't have resistance training on board uh, and you go on a diet, you will lose LBM. How much that LBM is glycogen and water depends um, but yeah, that's low testosterone. Can't so can you lose body fat with low testosterone? Absolutely. If someone is in the overweight or obese or even class one, class two obesity, that is probably the first thing that you would want to do. Um, and so we have this literature from bariatric surgery. The more weight that you lose in those circumstances, the more your testosterone will go up. So Weight loss for you or I, and I'm not making differences here. I'm just like, this is the nuance of it. Weight loss for those who are lean will result in lower testosterone. Weight loss for those who are, have too much, have, have passed their personal fat threshold, have too much adipose tissue on their frame and are starting to get into that chronic inflammation, all the, all of those states, those individuals losing body fat will most likely raise their testosterone and it will have it will be linear most likely no that makes that makes a lot of sense with that and it's uh again it gets kind of comes down to different for everybody and also i'm sure it has to do with um you know what's bound up in fat tissue and and what's not and and everything same kind of thing like you see with vitamin d right it's like sometimes when when a, an overweight person mm. loses weight yeah. vitamin d goes up because it's sequestered in the fat cells and when lean people get too lean vitamin d seems to go down so and probably it's probably acting upon something similar there that's out of my uh <laughs> my area of expertise. vitamin d is an acute I, vitamin D is an acute phase reactant, so we would ex I would expect vitamin D to go down in that state. That's why you see vitamin D is related to um, vitamin D as a canary. But low vitamin D will be related to lots of bad things. Um, I'm very happy to hear you say that because I, I that's another world again. Uh, it's like I wish we had a million hours, but where I, I feel like even just the constant promotion of synthetic vitamin D supplements. Mm -hmm kind of frustrates me because I'm like, it is, it's just a canary, right? Like, like, are we, obviously we have this broad scale issue with vitamin D and I know that sure, we're not getting as much sunlight. I'm sure there's a lot going on there, but like, I, I always try to say that I'm like, okay, this is a canary in the coal mine. Like this vitamin D is low as a result of something else. I have no idea what, like no idea. What, I mean, I, maybe I could make some guesses, but ultimately I have zero idea what. I don't think that we just like, it's all just a result of us being indoors all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, the people can listen to the Iron Culture podcast. There's they if you like if you want to listen to two and a half hours about vitamin D and vitamin D measurement. Uh, there's they have uh, Austin Baraki on there, and then I can't remember her name, but she's a primary vitamin D researcher, um, and it's very interesting to hear them talk about it. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a it's a it's a deep, very very deep dive into vitamin D, and um, Dr. Austin makes the he makes the same argument that I'm making for not measuring total testosterone as a net. He makes that same argument with vitamin D. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of moving pieces there for sure, man. 
Well, we're coming up on time, but I want to make sure, like, where can everyone find you? Uh, just, you know, multiple places. Where where can everyone find you? Uh, yeah, uh, Instagram at DR Ben House. And then Deconstruct Nutrition is where I put out a lot of my written content. And then Tommy and I have an advanced blood chemistry course on broresearch.com, which is which goes into if you like testosterone talk, we talk about it until you're blue in the face for <laughs> I think uh, we talk about sex hormones for uh, close to 10 hours. Nice. Um, so, yeah, if that, that's where people can find me. Uh, it's been it's been really fun um, to, to be here. And it's 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 an honor to talk to you, man. Yeah, man. I super appreciate your time. So cool. As always, I will see you all tomorrow.